Hello and welcome. Sorry about the delayed start. Uh, we are coming to you live from the Great Kruger National Park and sometimes Hohos climb into your electronics. Now, a hoho is a South Africanism for a, a bug or a beetle or any sort of creepy crawly and something climbed into the cables and chewed some stuff, but uh, it is all done. Uh, of course, my name is Brent. We've got Margot joining us. and We've got Grant from Endangered Wildlife Trust with us as well. And uh, we are going to be taking you on a live sunset safari, literally. Okay, Grant, say hi. Good <laughs> evening, everyone. Which was supposed to be good afternoon. Yes. Yeah, good evening. So we're just trying to get everything. Everything's been a bit crazy, of course, but um, we are live and we're going to be chatting about wild dogs, even though we're looking at wildebeest. Wild dogs eat wildebeest occasionally. Sometimes. Well, Sometimes. As often in South Africa as in East Africa, but yeah, they do. Everyone's very happy to see you there, Brent. Okay, there we go. Just checking. Thanks so much, Margot. Um, we're just trying to get all your questions through. So remember, if you want to ask us any questions, you can do that um, by just typing your questions um, into the YouTube chat or onto the Facebook chat, depending on where you are watching. So really, really great to have you all here. Now, we're going to leave these little wild bee beasts and see what else is out on the open plains. Now, Grant, tell us about your favorite and my favorite animal. Oh, I mean, there's so much to tell about the African wild dog painted dog painted wolf. Obviously, my favorite animal, your favorite animal, and South Africa's most endangered carnivore for those people not from South Africa. So it is South Africa's most endangered carnivore. And I've been working on them, more fortunate to work more research them in, in Greater Kruger since 2009. So, yeah, I've been, been quite a long time and um, keep on keeping on with, with conserving South Africa's most endangered carnival. And, uh, of course, you've got various different projects going on at the moment. Um, and one of your main focuses at the moment has been the collaring of all the packs, not only in the protected areas, but also in uh, other packs that are on the peripheries that go into well, areas of potential threat due to human wildlife conflict, snaring, roads. Yeah, so I mean, Brent, as, as you well know, that wild dogs are incredibly wide ranging species and then often range outside the boundaries of, of protected areas or formal protected areas. So over the last couple of years, it's been a focus of Endangered Wildlife Trust and myself to, to collar wild dogs outside the boundaries that are you know, in close proximity to, to private ranches and then come into human con or conflict with, with humans, so human wildlife conflict. Uh, so we've been, <clears throat> been collaring those dogs. And then also within the Greater Kruger National Park, which is our sort of most recent project, which is launched, which is just monitoring wild dogs based on the threats that they, they face and what they have been facing over the last couple of, or two decades really, in the Greater Kruger, which is, is snaring, disease, and, and human wildlife conflict. So we are currently collaring as many of the packs as we can. We've got 15 packs collared so far in the Greater Kruger, and we hope to have um, all of them collared before denning season, um, which it is in, obviously in winter in South Africa. So before June 2021, we're hoping to have as many of the packs collared as possible. Yeah, so that's part of the ongoing work that we're doing within the Greater Kruger. And it's linked to, to a near real-time monitoring platform where we get alerts if wild dogs go outside the boundaries of a protected area. So we get a virtual fence alert. And then we also get an alert if wild dogs go into an area with a high risk or threat risk. And it's either a snare risk or a human wildlife conflict risk or a disease risk. And that alert comes straight to the team and then we can respond to those alerts that come through us or to us via an API. So it's a, a collaborative project through a lot of organizations, a lot of individuals, and funded through a lot of different individuals and organizations as well. So yeah, that's that's what's keeping me busy at the moment and it's going very well. Well, and the moment, yeah, tomorrow morning, you're off bright and early to go uh, rescue, well, We'll follow up on, on alerts of snared dogs, yeah. So unfortunately we've had a number of wild dogs uh, packed snared in the last two weeks, which has kept me very busy. 
um, but without the collars, without following up on the GPS locations of the packs and the alerts, it makes life a lot more difficult. Um, yeah, so I've got to shoot off to, to Southern Kruger National Park tomorrow morning to follow up on some packs that have had come into contact with snares in the last, in the last week and just follow up on them. One of them has been um, treated by one of the veterinarians within Kruger National Park and we just have to follow up on the pack and then we've got an alert for another pack right down in the south near Bachendal Malalan area that I have to follow up on tomorrow morning. Now, the collars are quite influential in actually noticing when animals are snared. Yeah, so 100%. So that's linked to, it's linked to, it's quite complicated, but it's linked to an API which pushes through information about which, which we're feeding into the system in terms of where snares have been recorded in the past, where disease has been recorded in the past and then this API pushes through based on the GPS location of the collar. So the collar is sending through a GPS location, a global positioning system, telling us where the dogs have moved and it's vitally important then in following up on them when that GPS lo location gets updated we can see where they are, where they've moved and, and know, what tracks are next to you there? Hyena? Yeah, hyena. Hyena track. Like a single hyena walking down the road, yeah. Yeah, so GPS collars are incredibly important and, you know, something that's, that's unknown to many is how expensive they are. You yeah. know, a GPS collar, the, the collars that we're currently using from a company in Germany um, are 65,000 Rand. So, so just under $5,000 about there, okay? Yeah. yeah. Um, and they give us really valuable information. Um, Particularly in an area as large as, as Kruger National Park, which, which requires us to monitor the wild dogs remotely. We call this huge, massive areas with no roads, no roads, no cell phone signal, and these so these collars are connecting via satellite um, to transmit the data that's obtained on the collar, and that's part of what makes them so expensive. And we were really hoping um, we were going to have some wild dogs this afternoon, uh, but the pack that we've had lucky enough to have around for the last week. Uh, went north yesterday. Yesterday morning. Yesterday yeah. morning. And then this morning they, they came back south. They came back south. They turned around. So I was very excited. Uh, I was really hoping to be able to show everyone some wild dogs on our live safari this afternoon. But unfortunately, they're on the property just north of us where there isn't signal. Yes. So we wouldn't be able to get there. But um, yeah, I mean, hopefully, hopefully they do come back and we can, or well, people can see them on on your next live. Exactly. Drive. Whoop. Oh, there's a big hole. Sorry, Brian. For those of you wondering who's on camera, it is Brian. Vim was uh, beating down gremlins to try and get the live feed out. Um, so, we might see an animal that normally runs away from wild dogs, though. We're going to actually have a quick look for it. So, we're in for a bit of a cheat, a treat. Not a cheat, not a cheetah, a treat, a leopard. Um, there was reports of a female leopard and her two sub-adults in this area we're moving through to at the moment. Uh, there were tracks from this afternoon on top of our vehicle tracks from this morning. So we'll keep our eyes peeled uh, and also we're going to maybe go have a look for some Ellie's as well. I'm sure there's some Ellie's around. Uh, Brent, um, so there's Lady a question Macbeth about would like how, to know, long how long does a collar last for? Uh, so it, it varies on the species, so specifically for wild dogs where the main limiting factor is the size of the battery because of the weight of the collar. So it's limited to the size, well the size of the battery is limited to reduce the, the weight of the collar. And a wild dog collar, traditionally a satellite collar is lasting approximately 12 to 18 months. And then the battery needs to be replaced or with some of the older um, collar varieties the, the collar has to be changed itself it's not possible to replace the battery yeah. so a lot of people don't realize that it is the batteries that are the difficult thing about keeping uh, those collars operational and of course animals like elephants the collars can last three four years sometimes because they are so big uh, they are able to have a much bigger battery there was an impala i think in that gap it is now gapped it. But this is the last area where there was reports of leopard tracks. I'm going to go very, very slowly. We're going to head towards a waterhole. Uh, sorry, Margot, what was that question you had there? Uh, it was the same as you answered. It was about how lost. Ah, there we go. 
Um, so remember, if you guys want to get in your questions through, you can pop them on the, the chat in Facebook or um, on the chat in YouTube. So what I think we might have a little bit more success with the leopards a little bit later. So we're just going to meander up towards uh, one of the big water holes here and maybe we'll find some elephants having an evening drink. Uh, so Sharon wants to know, does, do the collars ever actually cause um, ma major interference for the dogs or how do you ensure that the collar uh, doesn't really affect the dog's behavior too much? No, so I mean essentially what it is is like, like from an ethical point of view is that the collar has to be a specific weight uh, or percentage of the animal's weight um, so that it's not affecting it and the materials which have been modified and sort of improved over the years is that the materials is an incredibly soft durable almost pliable material which doesn't then cause any abrasion or any effect on the collars sometimes the dogs or an animal will wake up and notice it you know just after the anesthetic they'll notice that there's something extra on them and sort of not be irritated but we'll just notice that it's there but generally speaking it really has no effect on the animal because it's so lightweight um, it's designed to to sit on the around the neck uh, and then it's really important that, that the individual or the person fitting the collar has got experience that the collar is not and fitted sure. on too tight or too loose or too loose yeah and that's something that is quite important you know and then it just comes with experience to ensure that the collar is not always fitted correctly which which can influence whether it affects the animal or not because uh, too loose is actually sometimes more of a problem than too tight 100 particularly with some some carnivores uh, like cheetah for example which are, are quite um, agile and, and flexible and they can fit their paw into the bottom of the collar and that can, be, that can be quite problematic with them getting stuck in it. So that is important that it's not too loose but um, too tight is obviously also something that you, you look at so that it's not causing any ill effects on the animal. Now Thelma, indeed, um, Thelma's asking has there been an increase in snares since the pandemic? So it's difficult, it's difficult to quantify without data in you know, across the area for bef before the pandemic. Yeah. But there certainly appears to be, and it may be anecdotal, that there has been an increase in snaring in certain areas. And it would make sense just because of the financial constraints that it's had on people living on the peripheries of reserves, for example, where there's been an uh, increase in poverty, a decrease in job availability, and that has then seen a rise in snaring. Um, as I said, it hasn't been quantified, but we, we certainly are seeing in the last couple of months uh, what appears to be an increase in snaring in certain areas. Now, one must also remember that, particularly with the snaring and the lack of tourism that's coming into this part of Africa at the moment, you are a lot of people who have a vast amount of experience in the bush and with animals are without work, without income and uh, they still do need to, to feed their families and with a lot of snaring in our area it, it's definitely not commercial meat poaching it's more subsistence poaching where if someone's just trying to provide enough for their family 100 percent. and then obviously of course with wild dogs it's not that the snares are targeted exactly. at wild dogs it's just wild dogs are innocent or accidental bycatch of of the the snares set for bushmeat for ungulate species and because of the wide ranging behavior of wild dogs often moving outside the boundaries of protected areas or then also just the their, their behavior habits in terms of moving crepuscular animals mm -hmm. moving along game paths to hunt in the early morning in the late evening they're often then quite susceptible to being caught in snares and that's obviously something that i'm specifically focusing on is is there a marked increase in, in the number of wild dogs being caught in snares as opposed to the number of snares being set that's out. Um, Rosalind would like to know how many uh, wild dogs do we have? Well, Greater Kruger, South Africa, Africa. So Greater Kruger National Park, the sort of contiguous area or protected area within Kruger, just under 300. We're about 280 at the moment. In South Africa, just over 500, 550 individuals. And then globally, the estimation is around 6,600 individual wild dogs. A very nervous looking impala disappearing there. Behavior you would expect when there, there was a predator out. Exactly. Well, wild, dog, well, wild, wild dogs, dogs are not yes. running already. Yes. And then um, Bobby would like to know, so 
how does the rest of the pack react to a snared individual in the pack? So because the, I mean, I'm sure many followers or, or avid um, followers of, of Painted Dog TV or Wild Dog Lovers would know that their social bonds are incredibly strong. So tight. So, and you can almost see it from, from collar data as well, is that they will almost never leave an injured or sick individual behind. So even if the collared individual isn't the individual that gets snared, they hang around that area for sometimes a couple of days and they I mean, won't leave that injured dog. You had that, what, two weeks ago? Yeah. With, um, was that a part of the Melitas? No. No, 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 no. it was the pack that we live collared. We live collared, 100%. Yeah. We live collared. One of the individuals there got quite a bad snare wound. We're not going to show you any pictures of it because we don't want you to lose your dinner. Um, but yeah, and they stayed with that injured individual till you guys were able to come in and, and treat it. 100%, John. Yeah. And that was over a period of, of three or four days that they were hanging around that exact same area, not even venturing, venturing very far to hunt just because that injured snare dog was not able, able to, to keep, keep up, up with the pack anymore. And they will wait for that individual um, to, to join and, and keep up with the pack's movements. And then uh, Margo, there's a question for you. Um, from Mars. Okay. Uh, Margo, what set you on your path of creating such gorgeous books? And where do they tend to find homes? Uh, well, I saw um, a poached elephant in Kenya in 2016. Um, and it was so um, shocking to me. I just I think as tourists often we don't see that side of um, what's going on with wildlife um, and I just felt like I had to do something. I had to make a book um, and so I started asking around photographers because I realized the more photographers I could get involved the better um, and um, yeah it was so well received that um, it, it became a series and suddenly I'm on the sixth book which is incredible. Um, and, and where do they find homes? We sell books all over the world. It's amazing. Um, we have distributors in the US, Canada, South Africa, and the UK now, but we sell all over the world. Um, and I think we've sold more than 32,000 copies so far. So I'm really grateful for that. That's, that's absolutely amazing. And guys, you can still get your copy of Remembering Wild Dogs. Um, just go have a look at the Facebook page, uh, and all the information on how you can get a copy of Remembering Wild Dogs will be right there. Am I correct, Margot? You are. Our Kickstarter is running until Sunday, so that's you need to pre-order um, your copy. That's the only place you can get it right now on the Kickstarter until Sunday. There we go. So a few days left to be one of the first in the world to be able to get uh, the Remembering Wild Dogs book. So we highly encourage you to do that. Now, one must remember that the funds raised by the Remembering series, and in this case, Remembering Wild Dogs, is going to different organizations throughout Africa that specialize in wild dog conservation, including our good friend Grant, who's sitting next to us here. Yeah, so that's probably an opportune moment to, to thank everyone that is following and is interested in the, the Remembering Wild series from myself out in the bush, trying our best to conserve wild dogs. Thank you very much. Please support the, the Kickstarter, which has only got a couple of days left, and, and get your hands on the book before, before it's launched, yeah. towards the end of the year. Be, be part of that. Be part of the pack, the leading pack, when it comes to getting the book. Now, I am hoping <laughs> that we're going to be have uh, some animals around the waterhole. Otherwise, I think we'll duck down towards the south. I wonder where all the Ellies have got to. So we are approaching Leopard Dam, maybe their namesake are hanging about. I'm checking the trees for you, Brent. <laughs> Thanks, Margo. Margo is checking the trees for us. <laughs> so, now of course, I'm, I'm gonna, wild dogs are my favorite animal, as you can see. I, um, our company is called Painted Dog TV and I fell in love with wild dogs at, a, at quite a young age. I was very, very lucky um, to spend a huge amount of time with them uh, sort of from about or my early teens. But the first wild dogs I ever saw were actually a dispersal, well not a dispersal pack, a free roaming pack uh, in northern Zululand that actually 
ran out from farmland in front of us and came on to Pinda and um, spent two days on Pinda and then disappeared. I think I must have been about seven or eight years old when I saw wild dogs for the first time. And I think the reason I fell in love with them so much, I think my dad got so excited when we saw wild dogs for the first time that I couldn't help but get very excited. They also happened to be my dad's favorite animal. Um, and then when we were in Northern Botswana, we had, at one year, I think we had three different packs denning in our concessions. So literally, you could just go from wild dog pack to wild dog pack. And the excitement of following them on the move, um, the, the social bonds that they have, it just, it just absolutely wild me. And since then, I will, I know there's quite a few of you there who will say, no, how could you, Brent? But I would, I'll drive past the leopard to get to the wild dogs. Happily, sleepy, smelly cat. <laughs> and uh, wild dogs have such a wonderful smell. Now, Grant, how would you describe the smell of wild dogs? As a, I mean, I couldn't physically describe the smell, but I think the only word that I've ever really thought, and it doesn't, it doesn't describe it, but the only word, the English word that I've ever thought of is, is a, a beautiful muskiness. It's, it's musky, musky, it's yeah. definitely musky. So if, if everyone asks me how to describe it, I, I, again, it's such a different one. I just say it smells like excitement <laughs> because I know there's stuff going on. <laughs> And it's actually incredible. You can smell dogs often before you find them. So when I'm tracking wild dogs, and they're incredibly difficult to track, lions and leopards are much easier to track just because of the pure speed that a wild dog can move at. I mean, 60 kilometers an hour for five kilometers. 100%. Yeah. And they just keep going and going. So they, they, they move at incredible speeds, which makes them quite difficult to keep up with. Shame. The poor badgers, our car, it, it had some... Um, abuse while following packs of wild dogs, trying to keep up with them. Uh, exactly, Liz, uh, those who've watched me for a few years will know, I go, puppies! I get very excited when I see wild dogs. Someone's asking, is the Toulon pack still around? Uh, Grant, someone's asking, is the Toulon pack still around? Yes, they are. They're still, they're currently just south of the Sabi River in in Kruger, Kruger. Okay. yeah. So um, what, near Lower Sabi, between no, Skakuza? No, no, no. Yeah, just, just north of Skakuza, actually okay. around. So for those that know the Kruger area well, uh, just around the the Marula Loop area. So between Marula Loop and the High Water Bridge in, in Skakuza, the Skakuza area. So they are, are around, but they, they often do go back to Den on Toulon's property, um, which is sort of the southern section of Sabi Sands, Kirkman yeah, and Slime yeah. Sands. Yeah. So they, they do often, they are still often going into that area at the moment. And then um, Valma says, when you're with dogs, do you ever actually remove them from the pack to sort of keep them in quarantine to heal? Uh, it's Oof, a question it's a that's asked quite often. Eh? It is a difficult one, uh, but and it's been it's it's been backed by research, and uh, it depends on the area. Though it is, it, you know, it is from a case to case basis. But I personally have found that the best the best medicine for the dog is the pack. Is the pack, yeah. Yeah, so, 100% agree. you know, try and treat in the field as best as possible, even with a snare, and generally with the rest of the pack looking after them, or particularly with a snare, once you get that wire off, or, you know, the, the, the actual material that's causing the cut or the abrasion or whatever from a snare, once that's treated, the rest of the pack looks after them, um, feeds them, and they generally are then able to recover quite quickly. It has been done in the past um, with, with disease outbreaks where they require vaccinations and follow-up vaccinations and that can be beneficial where you remove that individual away from the pack to prevent it, the disease from spreading to the rest of the individuals. But generally speaking, you know, my personal opinion is the best medicine is with the rest of the pack. A vet daily says, uh, I've seen them at the bridge corner. We now call it doggy corner. It's obviously the Toulon pack. The Toulon pack, yeah. Now, so what a lot of people don't actually understand is how intermingled the packs are and how, how the dispersal of the, the wild dogs works. Yeah, so which is really, for me, absolutely fascinating. I mean, it's something that we've, we've discussed this week, which is something that's, that's fairly rare. It doesn't happen all that frequently. Ah, yes. 
with uh, the alpha female and the beta female, so her sister dispersing from the pack recently. And you know, for, from our records, from Endangered Wildlife Trust records, and an ex-colleague of mine who's busy with his PhD, um, David Marnowick, or just finished his PhD, I think it was only, this is only the third time in 2000 dispersal events that the alpha female dispersed from the pack, you know. And then often the most, well, the most frequent or the most often formation of a pack is a single sex group of females and a single sex, sex group, group of males coming together, joining and forming a new pack. Um, so that's sort of like a, a clean formation of a pack. But then you get pack fissions and then you get pack fusions <laughs> and you get pack takeovers. You get multiple paternities in the same pack, so there's not really an alpha pair, and the you know so the the alpha male status is is not as rigid as previously thought, and so there's a lot of there's and, a lot of changes. And then and then you get humans rubbing dogs together, and packs. forming new packs, yeah. exactly, you know, and that's and that's been incredibly successful. Like with the range expansion program that's coordinated by the Endangered Wildlife Trust and the Wild Dog Advisory Group, which is a lot of individuals. Don't wait, I just guys, I want you to know what the Think about it, the Wild Dog Advisory Group. Wag. Yeah, wag. I could not get anything better. I'm not even sure who came up with the original <laughs> acronym. We'd have yeah. to ask someone like Harriet yeah, Davis yeah. Mostert who came up with, I mean, that was in 1998 it's, that yeah. sort of wag came came to be a thing within South Africa. Yeah, but I mean, so wag with with the range, well, which is now the range expansion project, you know, where wild dogs have been introduced into Mozambique recently, yep. into Gorongosa, which have, Oh, they're doing incredibly well, and we've just recently had um, so Katata 16. Yeah. No, Katata 12, 12 is still on sorry. the cards, but no, last week or this week actually, yeah, yeah, we've had the introduction from Gorongosa into um, Karangani. So, oh, it's in, from in, Karangosa in, into Karangani. so that's the first sort of Mozambique from one reserve to the other reserve within Mozambique. So, and that's just how successful the wild dogs in Gorongosa have been. And yeah, just with the increase in the population in South Africa through that range expansion exactly. project now, has been incredibly successful. A lot of people don't realize that South Africa is currently the only country in Africa with a steadily increasing wild dog population and cheetah actually. So the only country, and, and that has a lot to do with uh, the work of Grant and the rest of the team at EWT in managing the wild dog population, which is quite disjointed because they need massive areas. I mean, what's the average home range in this area? Well, in Kruger National Park, most recently, over 100,000 hectares would be the average. Just so over 100,000 hectares. 100,000 hectares for um, our American viewers, I think that's 240, 220 odd thousand acres, somewhere around there, for a single pack of wild dogs. Now, but depending, again, that depends on, depends on area, space, play availability, uh, play availability et cetera, et cetera. But they need massive areas. So what's happened is that in South Africa, we've got populations in the Kalahari, in uh, northern Limpopo, the Great Kruger, Zululand. Yeah. That's about it, yeah. Uh, then northwest. Uh, northwest, oh, yeah. um, And what's happening is now the chances of an all-female group or all-male group dispersing from these separated populations and actually joining up has become less and less with the, the amount of infrastructure and human uh, human farms etc in, in between so what ewt has done is it's pretty quite groundbreaking in yeah. terms of managing the whole country's population as, as a single population as it's one population exactly and i mean you can talk more about that having to move dogs all around to and ensure no, genetics and that. Of South Africa, so expanding outside of South South Africa into Southern Africa, and then hopefully eventually further, and it's essentially then human mediated gene flow, you know, which is which is something that that historically has gotten a bit of flack, but it's it's work, you know, it's you know the genetic variability within the meta population is good. We're constantly comparing it to to other large populations like the Kruger population, which is is largely an unmanaged population. Um, you know, with variable increases and decreases in the population, but at least genetically we are able to, to ensure that the, the population within what is effectively referred to as a meta population yeah. is, is viable and, and maintained at the highest possible level. Now, we've got some interesting questions here. Um, Grant, do you know what happened to the dogs that went to Tembi in 2019? Where were they from? I remember we chatted about them. There's been a couple. There's been a couple of moves within. The, so there still are dogs in Tembi in 2019, yeah. 
And then I was involved with a move, which must have been 2019. COVID threw a bit of a curve. Yes, right. Everyone's but it was, I'm sure yeah. it was, it was either 2019 or 2018 when we moved. And <laughs> the, I should remember the date more specifically because we moved dogs from Tembi to Twalu. Well, yes, so someone was just crash. saying, oh, yeah, you were in the, I forgot yes. about that. That was from Tembi yeah. to Twalu with Dr. Joel Elves. Yeah, you, we moving, Joel, and, and the wild dogs. And Yaku. We're and moving, Yaku. Yes, we were moving wild dogs for ten, from Tembi to Twalu. And we're in a plane crash, and that was 2019. So, so it must, it must be some, those dogs. Yeah, it must be those dogs that they're referring to. Yeah. So I mean, and and it, it's it's a constant, ongoing thing. And then, I mean, with Derek up in the Waterberg, that's a really fascinating pack of wild dogs in terms of just wild dogs in in South Africa. Yeah. I mean, so they've been they've established outside of protected areas. You know, one of the last free roaming populations of wild dogs in South Africa which would then be very similar to the other populations of wild dogs in Botswana Mana and, and Zim. you know, Zim further up into East Africa. But the difference is, is in, in South Africa, which is unfortunately, you know, the reality is, is that human populations are growing and, you know, um, urban sprawl is, is continuing to grow and habitat, the, the single biggest driver of population declines, unfortunately, is habitat destruction habitat isolation or fragmentation and you know the the Waterberg in South Africa is case in point where it's yeah. uh, an existing free roaming population of wild dogs and, and the a mosaic available. of game and cattle and and yeah so a colleague of mine Derek that's Derek van der Merwe that's working is, is it's, it's a constant battle to keep those dogs safe constantly collaring them using mitigation techniques to to prevent uh, human wildlife conflict uh, trying to manipulate their movements uh, with line scat, for example, which is a project that we've also just started now with a student just outside the western boundary of Kruger. So, wild dogs are constantly keeping us on our toes and we're constantly adapting and evolving to ensure the protection, effectively, is what it's become of, of South Africa's most endangered carnival. So, Lucille wants to know, what, what, what happens when two unrelated old packs come together? So if it's two unrelated packs with both sexes, so both males and females, it generally depends on the pack demographics. If one pack is a lot larger than another pack, that the smaller pack will then tend to run away. Run, run away, away, run yeah. away. Um, so yeah, a common misconception is that wild dog or different packs will actually fight with each other, but generally they will avoid each other. There's a pile of alarming Ooh. a little bit. This is close to where the leopards were, tracks were seen. They look quite nervous as well. Yeah. Look very nervous. Oh, what happened there? You never quite know. So there are two sort of. You see something? Oh, some movement. So there are two Very young nervous. leopards. About. Okay, we're going to go forward there. So there's these leopard cubs. There's two of them of about. 13 months. So if mom leaves them alone while she goes hunting, they can often quite just terrorize the local impala, Franklin, tree squirrels, dwarf mongoose, pretty much anything. And the last tracks of them were around here. Let's have a, just have a careful, careful look. Sorry, I got interrupted mid. mid yes, sentence, you're on there, but we'll take it up after we. We've had so much rain, the grass is so thick. A little bit further forward. Yeah, a little bit further forward, just a little bit. So what we'll do is we're just gonna sit here for a few moments while Grant keeps chatting. And uh, I'll try to see if I see a flick of a tail. Brian, and keeping a look out. What I thought was a leopard, or at least movement of a leopard, I completely lost my train of thought. Um, what were we what trying? Oh, the medicine? packs. Oh, yes, yeah. So, contrary to, to what many believe, is that wild dogs will fight with each other if, they, if, if two different packs uh, come across each other. I've actually seen fairly vicious mm, fights I've between seen big fights. Packs. Yeah, and but generally, stands. because they don't occupy a territory and they occupy a home range, they, they actually avoid each other. But uh, recent research has, has suggested that there are 
um, multiple packs will overmark or, or scent mark in the, in the same area. And that's also then part of, although they're not defending a territory, so to say, just to let the other packs know, like, we here, this is our area. And, and I suppose it might help with dispersals as well. So that yeah. I think I'm just gonna poke my nose, oopsie, into this bush over here. No squirrels or anything alarming. Uh, I say if those cubbies have been here all day, every squirrel who's got its have a quick look. Uh, Brian, I've got movement, one o'clock, something there. What was that? Did I see the flick of a tail? Ooh, I'm gonna be careful, there's some big rocks around here. Oh, grass is just so long at the moment. Owl calling. Let's see if we can spot him. Or it could be a forktail drongo being a bit of a bastard. Now, there's a bird <laughs> species called the drongo out here who will mimic this tiny little pearl spotted owl just so you can beat him up. Well, that sounded like an owl, not a drongo. Let's just go around. Well, it's the right time of the day for the kitty cats. Oh, they're still looking nervy over there. I think, let's see if we can find the little owl. And then... Oh, hopefully I don't get a flat tire. Oh, there he is. Okay. Back over the crunch crunch. doesn't want to be on camera, he's shy. Well, I mean, we purposely have come back to this area to try to see if those leopards were around. As it gets darker, they're going to be more relaxed. So we're in quite an interesting um, part of Kruger because it's only actually been part of the Greater Kruger for the last three years. The fences were dropped. Before that, you really didn't want to be a leopard on this farm. <laughs> it really didn't. So the, the current owners, um, dear friends of ours, um, have bought, dropped the fences, made it open to the Kruger, and uh, have sort of reinstated what na nature should have been here. But before, this was a, this was a hunting farm where you really didn't want to be a big cat. Cat. I've still got a sneaky suspicion that they closer to the house on the southern end of Impala Plains, where we saw those tracks of it earlier. Yeah. But of course, 
course, there could be anywhere. Yes, it's particularly in this grass. So, I saw another question there for you. <coughs> oh, wow. Yeah, kitty, kitty, kitty. Uh, Margot. Oh, a question yes. for you from Barbara. A bit of a loaded one there. What, do you have plans for another book? And if so, which species? <laughs> Oof, loaded question. <laughs> That's the question. If I got a pound for every time someone asked me that question, I wouldn't need to make books anymore. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I'm, I'm just concentrating on this book right now, and, um, and then I'll collapse. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. What was that? Was that an eye? of a bush baby in the distance. Yeah. I've got a feeling Impala Plains is the place to be, the southern edge of Impala Plains. That massive herd of Impala, if I was a leopard, that's where I'd want to go. Oh look, it's little students, I think. Yes it is, indeed. So the eco-training students out on drive. Smile, everyone. Hello, are we on TV? You're on. Yes, you are. Yeah, you're on uh, the Remembering Wild Dogs um, live broadcast. Fantastic. We're the leopards, guys. I hope you're coming oh, yeah, to do the work like for me, so yeah. I could just sort of arrive and look like a hero. <laughs> um, has Morris gone home? Yeah, he just got back to camp. Okay. Yeah. Um, we had some tracks going down, so I'm going to check the southern side of Impala Plains. Okay. Just in case. Sounds good. There's a herd of impala just up here, so. <laughs> yeah. Okay, guys. Well, good luck. Thank you very much. We'll see you later. Enjoy. Bye. Bye. That is not a leopard. It doesn't have spots. It's got stripes. It's a zebra. I got a feeling they're in here. They do like this little drainage system. Hold on, this is quite a steep crossing. Don't want to lose Brian on the back. And up we go. Oopa. Oh, that was a bigger hole than I thought. Who said men can't multitask? I'm driving, shining a torch, and reading questions at the same time. Sort of. <laughs> there you go, there's the, the striped donkeys. There's one of them around here that has been very, very lucky recently. Those ones are going away. Ah, let's just go. So um, for those of you who haven't been on a nocturnal safari before, we don't shine our uh, spotlights on uh, mostly diurnal species like zebra, impala, etc. So you can actually blind them and make them easy targets for leopards, lions, etc. So we tend to try and not shine on them. Um, their eyes are differently adapted to the, the predominantly nocturnal species. So I think Roslyn, Roslyn's joined us a little bit late. Margot, question for you. Um, uh, she'd like to know how long have you been doing the, uh, the have you been writing or producing books for? Uh, well, our first book, Remembering Elephants, came out in 2016. So it was 2014 when I first um, called Post Elephant and a couple of years to that first book. So, um, yeah, only five years um, and I've learned a lot. <laughs> but, um, I mean, I think the important thing to reiterate for people who don't know is that 100% um, of the profits that we make from our books um, go to conservation causes 
So uh, we run the Kickstarter every year, like we're running now, um, in order to um, raise the cash flow effectively to make the books. Um, and then when we print the books, we sell them when we launch in October, November. Um, and 100% of those profits um, go out to causes. So I think we've just gone over 50 different projects in 25 countries that we've supported and we've raised more than a million dollars from these books. So. Um, it's really brilliant that the books, you know, the money goes back to the species featured and, and exciting for us to be able to support people like Grant and EWT um, with, with money from this forthcoming book on wild dogs. It's an incredible, so over a million dollars in total from all the different books. And uh, the, the, the Remembering Wild Dogs took off quite nicely um, on Kickstarter. And uh, we're hoping you guys are going to help it finish strongly. Now, we're going to do a little bit of a whoop. Well, you might see lots of eyes as I do that on the wide there. There's everything a lion, a leopard, or a wild dog would want to eat out on the plain this evening. Lots of impala, zebra, wildebeest. Just drive very slowly through them. And some stripy bottoms. Ooh, that's, a... no, that's not the baby that just survived. As there's a there's a baby zebra we've been seeing here who got away from a lion a couple of days ago and it's got a massive gash down her her bottom but it seemed to be healing quite well but why i'm coming here is i was hoping that the leopards would be attracted to that tree line on the edge of this clearing it's quite often where we find them as it gets darker um, but i think we're going to try one last trick um, and hopefully we'll get some luck there. Sorry, Grant. Now, of course, you've got to remember that um, you will be able to join as part of Kickstarter. You can actually buy a private live safari where you'll be able to talk to me and Margot directly. I'll be able to hear you speaking to me directly like I can hear Margot right now. So don't forget, you, there's still a few seats left, am I correct, Margot? There are, yes, I think there are a few, um, and that's on Saturday, May the 8th, I think. Um, so, yeah, yes. really looking forward to, to that. And that'll be a longer drive compared to um, this evening's, not just yes, because of technical be, uh, issues, it's actually a longer one. <laughs> yes, yes, it will be longer, not just the technical issues. Um, and who knows, maybe the wild dogs decide to make an appearance then. I cannot believe Yo, is that a bush baby in a tree or a leopard on top of a rock? Where are my binoculars? Yeah, it's, it's really far. I'm just going to try to line this up, see if we're going to go there. Yo. So there's a, there's a rocky outcrop there and I'm just trying to figure out whether we're looking at, does it, it's not, the eye is not flashing like a bush baby. Okay, you know what? We're gonna go have a closer look. We're gonna go have a closer look. I can't leave an unknown eye out there. <laughs> I was hoping we'd bump into our little resident pair of jackals, but they're also MIA today. Oops, lots of wildebeest. Sorry, Gnus, coming past. Excuse Gnu. Oh. 
So we're just getting into our, our winter months now, and I'm sure as most of you are in the Northern Hemisphere, are quite happily heading towards your summer. I can't wait for winter. I really can't. I'm so tired of all the grass. I'm ready for the dry season. Uh, everyone's got their favorite time of the year out in the bush, and mine is definitely dry season. And, uh, well, May in particular, wild dog denning season, always a favorite. Hold on, back through the dry river. Oppa. Okay, this is we're on top of the hill. We're looking up towards this rocky outcrop on our left here. And I'm hoping it wasn't Bush Baby. It looked like a Bush Baby. Oops. Oh dear, the mystery eyes seems to have uh, done a mysterious retreat. Grant, what's your what's your money on? Um, if I had to put money on it, I would have said uh, bush baby. Bush baby, yeah. It's always a safe bet. <laughs> I would hope for it to have been a little leopard eye sitting on top of a rock. Yeah. But from that distance, difficult to see. Yeah. All I could and see in the, in, the, in the binos was just a tiny little spot. Oh well, a mystery it shall remain. Oh, bush baby. It is a bush baby. Um, I'll try, let's see if we can get a view through there. Two bush babies, in fact. It's a bit far for the camera. Okay, we'll do. Let's try. Let's see if we can get one last nocturnal sighting. So, what were you saying about the bush baby's eyes blinking at night? How do you tell it's a bush baby? Um, at a, well, just generally where it is is how you tell it's a bush baby. Uh, if they're sitting high up in a tree um, and it's sort of one little eye going. So a lot of people think you look at different colors of the eyes or whatnot, which is absolute hogwash um, made up by uh, someone many moons ago and it sort of became urban legend. So uh, eye color depends on the angle that the light hits it. But generally what you're looking for when you when you're looking for predators is the width between the eyes. So lions, leopards, hyenas, etc. Um, you're looking for a bit of width. But a small little eye high up in a tree, um, more than likely a bush baby uh, or a genet sometimes. But the thing is that with bush babies from a distance, um, their two eyes can look like a big single eye when you're far off. Aha, uh -huh, that makes sense. And also, obviously, with predators looking forward, they're uh, being predators, their eyes are forward facing. So you'll often see both eyes. Um, and with a lot of your prey species, your ungulates um, being prey species, their eyes are on the sides of their heads. So you'll often just see a single eye rather than two eyes looking back at you. Then again, occasionally you get a one eyed leopard. <laughs> or lion, actually. Or wild dog. Uh, or wild dog. Yeah, I've actually seen three, I've seen all, all of those. One-eyed lions, one-eyed leopards, one-eyed wild dog, one-eyed hyenas. Mm. 
Well, I think even if we haven't found a leopard this evening, just being in your the back of your vehicle is a huge treat for all of us. So thank you so much, guys, for the time you've given us. Well, uh, we're going to give you a predator, but not the type of predator you're expecting. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. And she's just made a kill as well. I'm going to go wider, Brian, with the light. How's that? Oh, a bit, bit duller still. Oh, she's just made a kill. It is a female golden orb spider. And she's just caught an insect. Now, I don't know how many of you out there know Rudyard Kipling, uh, his poetry, and the female of the species is more deadly than the male. He's, uh, he did a whole series of poems on deadly females, and I think he must have watched the golden orb spiders. Do you want me to go back a little bit, Brian? How's that? Here we go, and you can see she's busy injecting it. Oh, it's a driver ant she's caught, a red driver ant. Actually, I've seen very few of them this year. Yes, yeah. hmm. Oh, look, 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 look. Just behind her, I'm going to try to change the light, is a very sneaky male. That tiny spider just to the right of her abdomen, that is a male golden orb. And he is trying to probably mate with her while she's distracted. Um, they actually have to tickle her <coughs> abdomen and sort of calm her before trying to, to mate with her. Otherwise, they end up as dinner as well. So the males are tiny in comparison uh, to the large females. Careful, you'll end up as dinner. Now, for me, a, go a, go a golden orb's web is just this incredible um, thing. So, Brian, I don't know if we're going to be able to catch it at night, but there are a whole bunch of little kleptoparasites on her web. Now, a kleptoparasite, as is what it sounds like, it's a, it's a thieving parasite. So, there are... You might just see every now and then, it looks like almost a, a, a dash of, of mercury. You see there's one climbing up high there, Brian. That's separate from all the others. Might be easier to get. You see him? There. So I'm going to try. Got it. Now, that, I'm going to take it a bit wider there little dash of mercury there is called a dew drop spider or a mercury spider. Now, its abdomen looks exactly like a piece of mercury that you would find in a thermometer. And they are tiny, tiny little kleptoparasites. And they live in the, the, the webs of much bigger spiders. And because they're so small, they just eat the scraps that she doesn't eat. And they're sort of too small for her to bother trying to eat. So this whole species of spider basically survives off the scraps of, uh, in particular, golden orb and garden orb spiders. He's just chilling. Okay, let's see. She's feasting. The males are on high alert. Here we go. Well, unfortunately, no dogs or cats this evening, so you had to make do with a deliciously large female spider. Um, but from Grant and myself and from Margot, um, it's been an absolute pleasure being able to take you guys um, out on a virtual safari. And uh, hopefully we'll see you on the Remembering Wild Dogs virtual safari in May. Yeah, thank you very much for everyone following and for the support of Remembering Wild Dogs for the work out in the field.
Thank you very much. Thank you, Brent. Yeah, Indeed. thank you, guys. And thank it's, you. It's been brilliant. And thank you, Margot, for the incredible work you're doing to help save some of the most endangered species on the continent. Lots of love from the bush. Mwah. See you soon. Okay. Bye.